the military piece is what they want, Jan. They want us to spend all our money on the military, but you know as well as I do, a totalitarian and authoritarian regime like the Chinese Communist Party is, fears one thing, instability of their population. So how do they maintain control? They have to have an other. They have to have an enemy that's out to get them. And that's exactly what we are portraying ourselves as right now when we put all this money into the military arm element of power. Okay, so I'm going to jump back a little bit. We're going to, I'm not letting you off the hook with China yet. We're going to come back to China. But was something that's very interesting, you have a chapter at the end of the book where you offer prescriptions. And your prescription also sounds you know, kind of counterintuitive. You're saying, I think we really need to cut the military spending. And that is actually going to save a lot more lives and make the U.S. warfighting capability much more effective. I know, so, so explain that. Thank you for actually reading my book and getting to the last chapter, which is an enormous accomplishment. No, you know, I wrote the book to be accessible. Uh, here's what I learned from 17 years old to when I finally left government at, I don't know, 54, 55, 55, is and you kind of saw this with the Reagan administration. The only way you can force new thinking is you got to cut the budget. You got to reduce resources to the bureaucracy. And that forces prioritization, that forces new thinking. That's what I'm trying to get across with that. So then the next question is, well, how do you do this? I know, I know because I've met these incredibly talented people that are in our Pentagon and in our national security establishment, young people, creative. They see the fallacy of what we're doing right now, which is refighting the Cold War. When you have a trillion dollars a year of money, you don't have to, no original thinking required. I think we're playing directly into the hands of what the Chinese Communist Party wants us to do. So by cutting the budget, what I'm trying to get at is we have to have new operational and strategic concepts for dealing with the Chinese. Information, cyber, uh, you know, indirect approach. Uh, there's a huge population there that is not a fan of the Chinese Communist Party. We have the ability to influence that and, you know, advance our, advance our goals and also keep them from, you know, uh, being too bellicose. I can imagine, right, the argument that you hear when you say, look, we've got to, we've got to cut defense spending. People say, well, that's going to cost lives. This is probably the response, right? You always get that with any time you try to do something new at the Pentagon, when you know you're right when they throw that, you know, red herring on the table. They're like, this is going to, this, you know, so I was a civilian official. Civilians provide oversight of the military. That's how our republic works. And so as soon as you do something that the uniform military doesn't want, in this case, cutting force structure, cutting weapon systems, doing something different, that's the exact line you're going to get. And then, then now they, they offload all the risk onto you as a civilian. I'm good with that. I was like, I'll take it. Put, put some more risk on me. That's what I get paid for. But they always use that line, and I think it's a bankrupt idea because you brought it up earlier. <laughs> We're going to lose more lives if we keep doing the same old thing that everyone knows. Our playbook, nothing new in it, Jan. It's just rinse and repeat basically from World War II. And so it's very easy for the Chinese Communist Party to uh, operate against us because they have our playbook. We have their playbook too. We have unrestricted warfare, but we're not, we are not attacking it that way. That's a huge question for me. I mean, you read, you know, Stealth War, uh, Rob, General Rob Spaulding's book, you read, you know, the thing that came out in my discussions with him is that, you know, people in, at the Pentagon don't want to think this way almost. Whereas, you know, you kind of make the case in your book that special operators are this whole kind of division which functions very, very differently from the conventional warfare, you know, division of the U.S. military, um, actually is much more suited to, to thinking in this way. It's just that it's always kind of, it's never playing the major role, except perhaps in, you know, some of these campaigns like early in Afghanistan in 2001. Right. I used to get really upset with the bogeyman of the military industrial complex. It's so easy, you know. It just highlights what, you know, President Eisenhower was talking about. But I, here's the big revelation for me. I used to get angry about it, 
like how could we have a system where we have five major defense companies that make oodles and oodles of money beyond all human understanding and we have these small startup tech companies that can't that have these incredible technologies and ideas that can't break through but then I'm not angry anymore and it's been very helpful for me I sleep a lot better at the night now because the defense primes are doing exactly what the incentive structure is set up to do. So we have to change the incentive structure. That's why I talk about reducing spending. There doesn't have to be these hard choices about weapon system procurement and how we do business when there's just literally trucks full of money. So that's, you know, it, it, it's been freeing in some ways that I'm not so angry anymore. I'm like, yeah, no, we're doing, ex they're doing exactly what they should be doing in a free market. Well, it's not a free market for military equipment. That's, I think we need, that's my point is we need to, we need to reestablish, we need to establish a new incentive structure to break through that. And that will result in different operating concepts, different weapon systems and different ways of thinking that I believe will end up in the long run saving American, American lives, uh, or at least those in our armed forces. Listen, I have you here in this seat and- This is the know, hot seat, Jan. <laughs> I'm like, am I sweating? I keep thinking about, you know, this spy, people keep talking to me about the Chinese spy balloon, okay, mm -hmm. that got shot down and, you know, everything associated with that. And you know, more, most recently we learned that actually this balloon was tracked from the moment it launched in China. What happened with this whole situation? How do you explain this? How do I explain what, ha I, I can't right now. I mean, I'm like the rest of America. I'm like, what is going on here? So the president gets what's called best military advice from the chairman, the senior ranking military officer. He's called the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His counterpart, the person that his boss is, is the Secretary of Defense. That's the position I held. So what, if, what best military advice did they provide the president? It clearly, either he didn't follow it, which was, or he did follow it. If he did follow it, which, resulted in a shoot down after the doggone spy balloon went all the way across America. And I know what they're gonna say, oh, we collected all sorts of great intelligence on them. That's, you know, I talk about this in the book about the intelligence community, about how it's become unmoored from civilian oversight and control. I really wanna learn more about that because we, I don't know how to answer your question. And at this point, we should be able to answer the question, I would argue. So. Either, here's the other one that really bugs me. You triggered me on this one. Trillion dollars and we cannot take control of a balloon without having to send up a hundred million dollar fighter plane with and shoot a 400,000 missile. That's the cost curve I'm talking about. That's what the Chinese expect us to do, that we will bankrupt ourselves. We have all these exquisite weapon systems and we have so few of them that we, War is changing. We're going from exquisite, expensive stuff with very few of them. We're going back, you're seeing it in the Ukraine right now with unmanned aerial systems or uncrewed aerial systems and other things. We're going back to the cheap and plentiful versus the expensive and uh, expensive and few. And that's, I think the Chinese understand that and they love the fact that we continue to spend enormous amounts on weapon systems that aren't gonna be effective. You know, so is this, Reagan's Star Wars strategy in reverse. That's exactly my point. Jan, you got it. They're doing, that's exactly what I fear is, you remember how he was ridiculed for Star Wars. And in reality, it was part of this, it, it wasn't a deception plan, right? He was legit. We're still working on it. The advances technologically have been off the charts, but remember they made fun of him for that. The Soviets, we bankrupted them because they realized they couldn't keep up with us and we won the Cold War. I'm concerned the Chinese, exactly like you said, are doing the same thing to us, is they're saying, look over here, look over here. We're responding exactly the way they project us to, which is spend more money, spend more money. And then we talk about the greatest enemies. Everybody wants, is it China? Is it Iran? Is it North Korea? No, it's this unbridled military spending, which it could bankrupt our nation. And that's my point I'm trying to make, maybe inarticulately, but that's the point I'm trying to make in the book.